Hello, my name is Bob Barker, and welcome to today's uh, GC Advantage program. Uh, the topic today is, should I stay or should I go? Um, what to consider when contemplating a career move. Um, we uh, have some upcoming webinars that uh, um, we'll see on the screen here, and those who are, are listening. Um, the ne next one is going to be giving and receiving difficult feedback. And the one after that is creating an effective onboarding plan for senior legal leaders. Uh, today's presentation, as well as the, the slides, uh, will be recorded and added to our library of um, different uh, um, webinars that we've held. And, and they'll be available in about three weeks' time. And then everyone who registered for today's event uh, will receive a uh, notification uh, once those materials are available. Um, during today's session, um, please you know, ask questions. Um, and at the bottom of the Zoom um, you know, screen or app, there is a, a button that says uh, Q&A or it's Q&A icon. And um, you know, submit your questions there. If uh, and you can, what's nice is you can also see other questions which have been, that have already been submitted. So if you have a similar question, um, please use the up arrow or up thumb or um, uh, thumbs up icon. And uh, what that'll do is that'll move it to the top so that uh, today's speakers will know that that that's a. Um, a, a of interest to a lot of different people. And then we're going to, uh, we'll answer some of the questions during the session as best possible and, and have some time at the end as well, hopefully. Um, at this point, I look uh, to turn it over to Dave Yaman. And uh, Dave, it's all Great. yours. Thank you very much, Bob. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us today on the webinar or, or watching it on a recording. Today's topic, uh, something that I think everybody has to deal with at some point in their life, probably many times in their lives, should I stay or should I go? And we're gonna be talking about essentially the clash of factors you may consider when making a decision to make a move or not to make a move. Uh, I read a study at one point that over the course of a career, most individuals will make somewhere between 10 and 30 uh, decisions on whether to make a move, uh, to change roles, et cetera. Many of you I'm sure have done many of those moves already in your career. Those moves can mean staying with an organization, uh, deciding to actually stay in the role that you're at. It may involve taking another job within the organization that you're already working at. It may involve taking a, a move outside of the organization. Uh, it could mean an entirely different career direction and in changing industries or changing professions in any which way. Uh, the purpose of today's discussion is not necessarily to talk about how to source different career options or ultimately how to create a career plan per se, how to map your path. Um, your broader career plans and your life in general certainly impact your decision as to whether to make a particular move uh, or not. And you'll certainly hear uh, myself and, and Marjorie and Brian reference certain career oriented moves uh, along the way as we uh, proceed proceeded through our career. Um, but at the core of it, you know, our experience is that decisions to make a specific move uh, are often emotional. Um, and that emotion at a particular moment uh, can, can at times over influence a decision. And, you know, trusting your gut and listening to your gut is always a good thing. Having your emotions essentially uh, drive a, a decision that has significant impact on your life and your career um, is just something to be conscious of and questioning. Uh, whether it's the right thing to listen to or not. And so it's always difficult to decide whether you're making, quote unquote, the right move. It's hard to predict whether a certain move will work out. Um, and I don't think the goal is necessarily to predict the future and to try to map out every move in some uh, predictable way. I think the goal is to make the best decision you can make about a particular move at the time you have to make it with the information that you have uh, when you got to make that decision. So Hopefully our discussion today will leave you with a framework or at least a list of uh, considerations to think about when you're making that decision to stay uh, or to go and to ground your decision 
in a little bit of at least a consideration, a list of considerations, perhaps not objective, they're all uh, personal, um, but just being mindful to not let your emotions um, get the best of you too much. Um, and I say that because one of the biggest risks that I've seen and I've, I've witnessed it, I've been tempted to do it on my own from time to time, um, a lot of career moves that I've seen are often triggered by a desire to leave a situation rather than a desire to pursue, pursue a certain situation. And I think that over your course of your career as you're making moves, you always wanna be headed towards something, not just running away uh, from something or trying to get out of a certain situation. We've all been in situations that weren't ideal, uh, but regardless of what's going on in your current role, you always wanna be very intentional about where you're headed and making sure that you're pursuing something. So that's kind of the nature of today's discussion. And uh, I'm thrilled to be joined with uh, two of my good friends and two of my uh, former colleagues uh, that you'll get to know in a minute. But just a quick introduction from me. Obviously, you can get our full bios uh, in the public domain and, and you can look each one of us up. But just to hit some of the highlights that I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Brian and Marjorie to do the same um, and kind of running the bio through some of the key decisions and the key moves that we made. Um, I came out of law school with having no idea of exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, I hardly made a decision to go to the Wall Street firm that I did. It's just that if you're in the New York City area as I was coming out of law school and you do uh, well enough, you end up at a big New York City firm and that's where I ended up. Um, and I found that uh, that wasn't uh, my ideal of, uh, of the life I wanted to live. And so off to PepsiCo, I went in-house, made the move in-house to PepsiCo where I spent the next 22 and a half years until I left there last uh, April. And I essentially had a career within a company and along the way made various decisions and moves inside of PepsiCo and made some decisions not to leave PepsiCo at different points in time. Um, ultimately walked in as a, as a junior lawyer and became the global general counsel, all from kind of making decisions along the way. Um, and some critical decisions for me were moving out of a, the corporate environment into which I had entered PepsiCo. So I worked at the holding company level for the first five or six years, and I had an opportunity to move to an operating role. So I got out of the corporate environment and got much more into making stuff and marketing stuff. Uh, that was a big move for me. Um, later on, I made a big move to leave the law department and go and change paths, albeit within PepsiCo. And I moved from the legal department to the compliance and ethics department. So many of you uh, out there in the webinar may have had that opportunity or made that move uh, one way or the other between legal and compliance and ethics, which has become its own profession over the last 15, 20 years. Um, and then ultimately, uh, even after becoming uh, the general counsel of PepsiCo and thrilled and, and totally enjoying my job uh, and my career and my life there, I made a, a big uh, move to leave PepsiCo uh, about a year and a half ago to uh, enter the life that I'm living now, which is as a leadership development consultant, um, working with a good friend of mine. Uh, and I also joined Barbara Gilmore as a senior advisor. So that's how I got to be where I am. And let me flip it over to uh, Marjorie to uh, do the same kind of intro. You're on mute, Marge. Apologies. Thank you, Dave, uh, for the welcome to this uh, great webinar. Um, it's really a topic that is um, of great interest to me, given my 17 years at PepsiCo and what that has entailed, which has been a variety of phenomenal experiences. You know, I, I similarly joined a big law firm coming out of law school, not really understanding what that was or what that it would entail. I thought I was going to become an intellectual property lawyer and soon discovered that I actually liked transactional work, M&A work, and that I could actually use my Spanish language skills to do it which was a bit of a nice surprise. And then, you know, when I joined PepsiCo, I, I had no idea that frankly, I was gonna be able to leverage that same skill set um, going into a variety of different roles. But, you know, similarly, you know, when you uh, are with a company for a really long time, you know, there's no way to stay at a place unless you're growing and you're, and you're really expanding your scope and, and really just getting into different types of things. And, and there were two roles that I think for me were critical and perhaps I didn't choose those roles. Uh, they were chosen for me, but I think upon reflection, I realized how significant of an impact they had on my, on my development in my career. Uh, the first role was really becoming um, the chief counsel for this kind of newly created set of corporate functions that were, were global in nature. 
uh, covering a, a variety of different areas like marketing and global procurement and R&D. And in that role, you know, having the exposure to so many members of our executive committee at PepsiCo was really a huge stretch experience. Uh, and then later on becoming the general counsel of Latin America, which for me was a bit of a return to our Latin America business, but in a, in a very, very different context and really having the opportunity to, to show what I had learned over the years and truly have an impact. So, you know, I am similarly now the, the, the global chief compliance and ethics officer for, for the company. And, you know, the jury's still out in terms of what the impact will be on that role. And I'm still learning it and growing at the same time. But, you know, really, I can't say enough about the opportunity that PepsiCo has given me over the years and, and truly many, many different expansions. So thank you for that. And I'll hand it over to Brian. Great. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, Dave, thanks for the intro as well. So similarly, my story is the same. It's currently the EVP and Chief Legal Officer for Cedar Fair Entertainer, Entertainment Company. But I started out as well going to law school, um, knowing that I didn't want to be a litigator. That wasn't my path. I knew that corporate America was ultimately going to be my path. Did the law firm thing for five years and the opportunity came to go in-house and uh, similarly with Marjorie and Dave, I moved in-house at PepsiCo, worked there for 12 years in a bunch of different roles, had the opportunity, I started in the corporate side of things, and then eventually moved over to uh, the marketing and sales side of the legal department um, for my last eight years there. Uh, ultimately there, 12 years, and the opportunity came to uh, leave PepsiCo, which was a very tough decision, and we'll get into the whys about that later on. Uh, but ended up moving over to Nestle, um, Nestle Waters uh, in Stanford, Connecticut, which was a great opportunity for me. And then from there, uh, yet another step uh, forward for me, got me into a general counsel position at WWE, which was then followed by my current position at Cedar Fair Entertainment Company. So you'll see that we all have slightly different paths and got to our, our current positions in slightly different ways, but there are a lot of similarities that uh, we'll be talking about as well. Great, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Marjorie. Uh, careers can absolutely be a roller coaster, Brian, huh, Brian? Uh, absolutely. Peter <laughs> Fair owns a, a, a variety of uh, amusement parks around the, uh, the country, so hopefully everybody's had a chance to have some vacation time at one of Cedar Fair's great parks. Um, oh, look, thank you. Absolutely, always be marketing. <laughs> Hey, we wanted to, um, you know, amidst all the emotion of making a move, you know, our effort was to sit down as a group and try to come up and, and create a little bit of a framework that each of us has, has used, whether formally or informally, um, you know, over the years in making a move. And we tried to at least reduce this down to something that everybody on the webinar could digest uh, and maybe walk away with or at least think about. And so on the screen, what you see is essentially a, a high level list of different considerations uh, that you may want to take uh, into account when you're thinking about making a move. Uh, again, as stated up front, uh, obviously your career path, and there's probably a, a level higher than this, uh, that's kind of your compass uh, as to which way you want to go in your career and, and what's going on uh, in terms of the big macro picture. But when it comes to actually making a particular move, um, in an effort to try to take some of the emotion out of it and try to get a little analytical and to make sure that you're being you know, fully contemplating uh, of all the different factors, we try to boil it down. And we put these factors into four different boxes. Um, and notable to me is, and I, uh, you know, we were trying to come up with this, this slide. We tried to uh, prioritize, we were moving boxes around, which one's more important than another. And I don't think there's one box that's more important uh, than any other. Uh, at the end of the day, I think any one of these may trump another box, depending on what's going on with your particular situation. So these aren't necessarily in any particular order, uh, but just to run these real quickly and just to kind of walk through some of these and, and to tell you what we were thinking about. Uh, in the upper left, the, the learning and growth box, I do think that's foundational. Uh, you are working with your career. You do want to be uh, learning all the time. You hopefully want to be growing uh, all the time. And so kind of th three quick thoughts in kind of the learning and growth bucket you know, first about the sub substantive knowledge uh, that you're developing, uh, which hopefully is accumulative over your career. Um, but I think it's always important to consider whether you're developing your substantive knowledge, whether you're getting experience uh, in an expansive way. 
Uh, and that can be either in, in a broader way, meaning you're growing horizontally, um, uh, or you can in, or you can delve into, I'm sorry, you, you can grow horizontally, meaning you can branch into other areas. So sometimes uh, somebody working in marketing, they can jump over to sales. Somebody that's working in a regulatory practice can go to a contracts practice. You can take on new uh, areas uh, or you can go deeper. Uh, you can become just a trained expert in whatever field uh, that you're working in. So from my perspective, it's kind of, are you, do you have the ability to grow either horizontally uh, or vertically? Uh, it's important to think about whether the current opportunity that you're, you're in, the current role that you're in, or the new opportunity that you might be considering is going to expand you either horizontally or vertically. Um, secondly, it's important in any organization to understand the org chart to understand your place in the org chart uh, and to gather some intel as to whether you have the ability, the capability, whether the org chart actually provides you room uh, to move uh, or perhaps there's another org chart that you can find your way onto. Um, but importantly, um, and I think critically, if you're thinking about making a move somewhere else outside of your current organization, uh, one of the questions and thoughts that I don't see enough people consider is to inquire as to what the org chart of the new opportunity organization looks like. You often understand the org chart of your current um, uh, organization because you're well, well versed on that organization. But when you're considering in particular a move outside of the organization and it's in a new entity, uh, it's critical to understand that org chart uh, as well. Uh, and a final thought, at least in this upper left-hand box is the financial growth. Um, Last I heard, most people work because uh, you actually earn compensation. That's obviously a critical factor. I never viewed it as the number one factor, but it's certainly something that we all keep in mind. And I think it's important to think about whether your current role gives you the opportunity to grow your compensation or whether uh, another role will allow you to do that a little bit quicker. Um, and important to that consideration is to understand your own compensation in the organization that you're in and making sure that you understand the full value of total comp, whether that means equity or pension or perks or other benefits. Um, and also critically important to understand what your worth may be in the market, um, which can be a little bit of a tougher thing to figure out, but it's certainly a critical factor as you think about that last financial uh, bullet point. Um, let me pause right there on learning and growth and, and turn to Brian and Marjorie for any thoughts you have or uh, if you've ever taken a shot at kind of assessing your external market value, if, if somebody were going to go about that, how would they do it? Any thoughts? Margie, I'll let you go first. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think I think it's really important to properly assess kind of what at least I, the way I've always done it is in kind of five year increments. You know, am I growing? Am I learning? Um, you know, not only from a legal technical perspective, right? I always wanted to be somewhat of a, of a generalist. So I, I had an interest in learning about different areas of the law. Um, but then how does that knowledge help you become a better leader in your law department uh, in the organization you're in? And I think that's really, really critical. Understanding obviously where's the room to grow um, professionally within your organization is really, really critical. And I think that the financial piece is something that we don't talk enough about um, because so much of it is confidential, right? And, and even understanding where you stand vis-a-vis -vis your peers, but then also in terms of understanding what's going on in the market. Um, you know, when you are with an organization for a really long time, it's hard to get a better sense of what's really out there and what you're level of experience is actually worth. And I think that that's a, a really significant piece to the to the puzzle in analyzing any move that you wanna make. No, I, I concur with all that. You know, I'll just add that I think for, for the knowledge growth, I think it's important, similar to Marjorie, I'm one who always wanted to be a generalist and, and make sure I had the requisite skill set, you know, in order to move up the chain and get to the position that I'm in today. Um, it's not always easy to get those opportunities, but you have to seek them and having a plan as Marjorie mentioned, and we keep, we'll get into that a little bit um, further, having that plan and, and building those skill sets will help you in that learning and growth bucket that, that Dave mentioned. 
it'll allow you to figure out, okay, where are the opportunities in the org chart for me to grow? Um, you may end up taking a, a lateral move in order to make that, you know, move up that org chart ultimately. And then, you know, lastly, like Marge was saying, the financial piece is not something that we talk about enough. And I think that I honestly think that folks do themselves a disservice by not understanding fully what the comp potential is. Again, it, should it be the driving factor? I mean, that's up to you. I mean, it, it's not for me. Is it important? Of course it is. But certainly it's it's something that you have to look into to understand like, okay, well, if, if I have whatever my life situation is, you know, am I going to be able to adequately provide, you know, based on where I'm at today uh, or in your current role? So, you know, this is, as Dave mentioned, these are all very important buckets. I happen to think this one is is particularly important, mainly because it's very foundational in terms of your your professional career and your ultimate development. And I used to joke on that first bucket that, uh, you know, generalists, I kind of swim in the kiddie pool. It's about the, you know, it's a huge surface area. But it's got about 18 inches of depth, meaning I know a little bit about a lot of different things. Uh, and that's got value to organizations and to you as you grow your career, or you can swim in the, in the diving pool, which has a much smaller surface area, but you can really go deep on a particular area. And that's got value too. It's just important for you to understand where you are and how you want to grow. Uh, but to Brian's point, to always be growing. Hey, on the org chart point, uh, we got a good question from uh, um, Bonnie in the audience and just asking whether it was practical to think that a, an organization as you're applying or being a candidate in an organization, whether they would actually share an org chart. And she highlights that she often does a little bit of LinkedIn research to understand uh, kind of if she can find out where this position fits into an organization. Um, I agree with Bonnie, it's probably unlikely that an organization is gonna, gonna uh, share an org chart per se, but I do think it's fair uh, in the context of pursuing an opportunity at a new organization to understand, for example, how many layers below the general counsel the position sits, mm -hmm. or um, in which you know department do I work in, and how many people are at that level? Uh, and so I think there's different ways and different questions that you can ask that are fair questions um, in in a uh, in an interview context. That probably is something short of obtaining a copy of an org chart, but tries to get you some of the information to help inform whether you'll have an opportunity to grow uh, up the org chart in that organization. Um, and finally, on that last point on the financial part. Um, understanding your market value is an important thing. Understanding your current comp is really important, uh, but then trying to test it against the, the market is a little tricky. Um, it's often something, to, as to Brian and Marjorie pointed out, uh, a little bit uh, difficult to talk about. But um, you know, as, a, as an unabashed plug, uh, groups like Barker Gilmore and some other organizations put out some really good compensation surveys, uh, information put out a report each year. And so Barker Gilmore put out their in-house uh, council compensation report back in June, which at least gives you some data points as to what folks in the market are earning so that you can do a, a little bit of a comparison um, against your own comp where you are. Um, so look, that's the um, um, upper left-hand box, uh, box on learning and growth. And I'm just uh, watching the Q&A. Um, I think I just kind of hit a little bit of the benchmarking, CLO, GC, Comp. You can get some of those uh, reports out there. There's a couple of organizations, as I mentioned, Barker Gilmore included, that put out reports on the, uh, the compensation, uh, especially at the, the top of the house, but averages uh, amongst other organizations based on size and level of attorneys uh, as well. Um, but let's move over to the organizational bucket. You know, as you think about whether you're individually uh, learning, and growing, I think it's always important to understand the organization and industry that you're working in. Um, and I think there's some critical factors to think about as you're debating a move. Uh, first on the industry front, do you understand your industry? Do you enjoy your industry? Is your industry in a healthy spot relative to what's going on uh, in the world and society? Uh, next at the organizational level within the industry, you know, where does your organization sit? Um, some of you may work in government or academia or other uh, non-corporate uh, environments and stuff. It's a little bit of a, a tougher uh, analysis to make, but within uh, at least the marketplace, every organization and company, you know, has a certain market share, has a certain position uh, within that, uh, that industry. Uh, and you have to ask yourself whether the company is in a good spot within the industry it's, it's competing in. Um, do you know whether it's growing? Do you know whether it's got steady prospects? 
uh, for financial health, uh, what's the state of play and the health of the business. Um, and if possible, and this obviously can be difficult, um, do you have any sense of whether there's any coming reorganizations? Do you have a sense of whether you're gonna buy things or be sold um, or other changes that might affect kind of the structure and stability of the organization that you're working in? Uh, just things to think about. Uh, and finally, around culture and reputation, um, kind of a general bucket of, hey, do you fit in um, to the culture of the organization that you're working in? And ultimately, what is the reputation of the organization? And I always used to simply ask myself, am I proud to work you know, at PepsiCo, uh, which, I, which I always was. Um, and so just a couple of factors uh, in there. And you know, one question that comes to mind, and Brian and Marge, I don't know if you have thoughts on it, um, you know, if, if you were trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the state of play is with your industry or where, what is the sense of your organization or the strength of your organization within that industry, any thoughts about how, you know, your average hardworking attorney in one of those companies can, can get a sense uh, of that? Probably a little bit more directed at some of the folks that are a little more junior uh, on this webinar. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take this one first, uh, particularly since I was the one that has made some moves. Um, externally. So what has always helped me is, you know, obviously there's plenty of third party research out there and diligence that you can tap into to understand, um, you know, where a company might be, might stand, particularly if it's a public company. Um, I think a great resource, even though it might be a slightly painful read uh, for all those securities lawyers out there, or compliance lawyers out there, is reading 10Ks, reading annual reports really gives you a good sense as to, okay, it is storytelling, but it is it does give you a sense as to where the company is, a uh, company that you're potentially thinking about, where they stand within their within their industry, how they how they see themselves growing over the next five, seven, ten years, which is going to be in the sweet spot of your your potential tenure there. Um, and then, of course, understanding the industry and understanding the competition is a bit, very big piece of this because if you're going into a new industry, and the three of us have all been in some realm of CPG, um, and I've just moved on a little bit to hospitality and leisure, but understanding the players within your industry to understand how strong the industry as a whole, how, you're, how strong your competitors are, very important to understand that in terms of making a decision on your ultimate move, um, potentially out of one organization into another. Yeah, great points. Thanks, Brian. Hey, um, you know, there's one question from uh, the audience that I think fits in nicely here and just reads in connection, um, you know, can you talk about how much detail to share with recruiters or others about why you left a role if you're leaving over culture or toxic leadership? And we'll get to kind of some of the leadership points in the next box uh, on this slide. But my own uh, two cents in response to this question is uh, it kind of goes back to my opening point is even in situations where you feel like you need to get out of or leave, you always want to be headed somewhere. You want to be pursuing something. You don't just want to make a move because you're leaving. I don't want to be naive because there can be situations uh, like that, but relative to talking to recruiters uh, or others, if some of that stuff's public, they're probably going to already have that understanding or some level of that understanding if you're in the market. Um, and if it's not public, I don't think you get very far in talking about some of the factors as to why you're leaving an organization. I think you want to turn your narrative into why you're attracted to the opportunity, um, you know, why you're looking into the market to grow in a different way, or what kind of opportunity you're pursuing that you think would be beneficial for you. Uh, so I don't think there's a lot of upside to that uh, in terms of because um, you, your view of what's toxic. Uh, may be very productive in somebody else's mind. So I think there's a little bit of a trick in there, but obviously a really nuanced uh, type of question from my perspective. Um, any other thoughts from Brian or Marjorie, at least on that one? No, I mean, I think I think that, that you said it uh, correctly, Dave. I think that the important thing to have a very clear narrative about is where do you see yourself being most successful? What type of culture and what type of organization is is the right fit for you to be to a have the the most impact and 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 be where you would be the right fit so whether you're trying to jump out of a burning building or just look for the the next big opportunity 
it's that you don't really have to get into the details of what may be going on behind the scenes. It's it's more about um, you know where you see yourself and and where you can have the most positive impact, which is what recruiters want to know about to make the right matches anyway. Yeah, and an interesting question that just popped in that, that dovetails with what you just said, Marge, is kind of a question about you know the emotions around culture. You know, when you don't feel like you got to get into you fit into the culture or the culture, you know, cues that that may be sending negative messages, or at least you're interpreting it that way. Specifically around kind of DE and I uh, issues, which which absolutely can get uh, emotional. And and the question is kind of how would you recommend weighing the impact of culture um, on determining when it's time to make a move? And I think you you were just talking about some of that. And I would just say from my own perspective. Um, you know, being proud, I, that's why I would just simply ask myself the question from time to time, am I proud to work here? Um, you know, am I proud to work at the organization? I think when you're proud to work in an organization, you unleash your best self. Uh, and so when you're up against an environment for whatever reason, culture, leadership, management, whatever the situation is that doesn't make you feel proud about what you're doing, you're kind of drain your energy. That's a hard environment to work in. Uh, and so I do think if you're really being, um, you know, distracted or if you're focused on those issues or the culture uh, issues are, are hitting you pretty hard every day, then it's probably time to take a peek at the market and see what else is out there and at least do your exploration because there are plenty of organizations out there in the market that you absolutely can feel uh, proud of. That said, no organization is perfect. Uh, and so you got to really assess, I think, whether the grass is greener uh, out there or how bad is it really where I'm at or where I'm at. Uh, and again, make sure that you're going somewhere that you that you have good confidence in is going to be better. Um, let me just flip to the bottom left hand box here. Some of the questions coming in and thank you, everybody, for the questions so far um, to the people issues and a couple of issues on this front um, on the people side. Three different uh, things that we thought of, you know, first, the organizational leadership. You know, do you look up at the, the leadership of the organization that you're working in, the company, the CEO or whomever? Uh, do you feel uh, trust in them? Do you believe in them? Um, and does the organization as a whole, you know, kind of uh, support the development of people? Is there mentorship available throughout the organization or some way to get into mentorship? Uh, is there an organization uh, from a leadership perspective that can allow you to grow? Uh, secondly, a little bit more close to home is your department leadership uh, folks that you can believe in. You know, do they care about your career? Uh, do they know who you are? Uh, are they candid uh, with you about where you're at? Do they empower you? Are they responsive when issues come up from within the organization? You know, what's your sense of department leadership? Um, and finally, and I always think it's important to look left and right. Uh, I'm on this panel with two peers that I was just, you know, thrilled to work with, uh, who are colleagues of mine who helped me grow, who pushed me, who uh, I could come to with, you know, different issues at different times and feel I had the, the best thinking from them and they were helping me through tough issues. And so there's there's always the question to me of looking, uh, you know, left and right and the folks that you're working with um, to check those out. So thoughts about um, those points at all on, on the people side, Marge or Brian? I mean, I know for me, this has been huge, right? Um, understanding not only how am I growing from a technical professional perspective, but understanding how I can grow as a leader, which sometimes as lawyers, we don't necessarily focus on. Um, but the reality is that when you're working in-house in large or small organizations, you have to learn how to A, manage team, manage people, but also influence the organization. And I think that when you have a department and a leadership that uh, wants to invest in you in terms of your leadership development, I think that's really critical. Um, and I think that having peers and colleagues that you just enjoy working with, that you're learning from, that make you better, uh, goes hand in hand with the culture uh, aspect of it. And I think that you can't necessarily take that for granted. And that's, I know for me, it's been a huge factor in, in me being at PepsiCo for as long as I have been. Yeah, I, I echo all of that. That's that's well said, Marjorie. I think the the concept around leadership and lawyers is, you know, I don't think people fully grasp it as much as they should, because when you're in-house, you do have the opportunity and sometimes the expectation to be a leader. And in which case you should be taking stock of whether the organization is going to aid in your professional development. Will you have sponsors? Will you be able to have mentors that will help you 
you know, uh, through some tough times within the organization and sometimes even outside the organization. I happen to be very fortunate that I have uh, a few mentors from my PepsiCo days that I still stay in touch with and run through, uh, run things by on a quite a regular basis. So it's important to really have that. The last piece I'll, I'll talk to is, and, and I can't say, speak uh, highly enough about the importance of this around peers and, and your team, whether it be you're reporting up, you're reporting down, and of course, side to side. Um, you know, as Dave mentioned, I mean, Dave and Marjorie are, are good friends of mine. They were colleagues for a very long time, and, and I confide in them on a number of things over the years to help me out through, you know, some difficult situations and some tough times. And it, having that makes your work day, your work experience, your professional experience that much better. Today's point about being proud of where you work, you know, there's the company overall. Um, you know, I happen to be in, you know, products on the shelf, uh, product on TV, or, you know, a place where you go to enjoy yourself. It's all about making people happy. That's one sense of, the, of pride. The other sense of pride is who you work with, because that's who you're going to be with day to day, um, sometimes more than, you know, the people at home. And uh, it's important to make sure that you feel really good about being there with them. Great. Thanks to you both. Hey, a, a, a quick question that may slide into here before we move to the bottom right hand box. Um, so there's a question that came in and, and uh, from an individual that's been practicing for 12 years in general corporate and securities, most of which was in-house in the same industry at two different companies. So general corporate um, and securities in the same industry. A um, little worried about becoming pigeonholed in that industry and not being able to jump out of the industry that, that he's in now. Um, you know, the question is kind of how focused should I be on broadening my industry experience at this stage to maximize future opportunities? And I'll, I'll give my own thoughts and if you guys have other ones, uh, chime in. But my own thought is that, look, as a general corporate and securities attorney, you got some skills that are probably more transferable than industry expertise. Uh, so I, I would, at the very least, want to talk to some recruiters and see how else you could articulate your skill set to apply in a lot of different industries. Because I think if you're truly a general corporate or you know a securities attorney, you probably got flexibility to jump a little bit easier than other folks. Uh, and then my next you know thought goes to you know what do I think about the industry? The, the questioner references that the industry's uh, big, um, you know, which says that there's opportunity within you know the industry if you were actually were pigeonholed. Uh, but how do you feel about that industry? Is it an industry that you you do want to leave, or do you think you're more attracted to, to something else in another industry, then you can have a shot at pursuing that. But I would think that, um, you know, 12 years in, if you are pigeonholed, you're probably already there, uh, to be honest with you, if you've been 12 years out and you've been in the same industry the whole time and stuff. So, um, but I do think you're probably a little bit more flexible as a general corporate and securities attorney. Um, yeah, Dave, I, I agree with that. I think the first point is, is, the, is the main one is that it's a, it's a set of skills you know, that, that you're referring to that are very much transferable um, to a number of different organizations, let alone industries. So I would definitely lean into that and not obviously take stock of the industry that you might be considering um, going into, but it's really more about how do those skills transfer. And in this case, I think it transfers quite well into a number of different areas. A bottom right-hand box, maybe the most nuanced and a little trickiest of one, and certainly a personal one as labeled. Um, you know, I call it the life matrix. You know, it's all those other uh, decisions that you have to make uh, because you're flying your own plane and only you can fly it. Uh, so thinking about, you know, what you got in terms of a family, the lifestyle you want to lead, the geography you want to live in, uh, the location. Are you, you know, in a city? Is your company in a city? Is it out in the, in the, in the countryside? Um, how about, you know, do you have a commute, you know, are there remote flexibility options, what are the perks, all those different things that go into the life matrix. And obviously important to kind of get some of the emotion out of that and really be contemplating with some um, quiet of mind, uh, how those factors line up for you. Um, and then kind of a general point about just the process. If you are looking to make a move, 
um, the process takes time. It takes time to prepare and get geared up for a search. It takes time to go through the interview process. It might take time to find the right opportunity. Um, it takes time and energy. And then ultimately, if you're successful, you're actually going to make a big transition. You're going to leave the place you're going to. You're going to move to a new place. You're going to have to rebuild your reputation and relationships in the new place. And it's just important to be geared up um, for that kind of uh, that kind of move. Uh, pretty critical um, along the way. Um, a bunch of questions flowing in um, that I think might might fly into this last bucket or at least get triggered. Um, one of the questions is any thoughts to explain a shift to a lower level position? So perhaps not horizontal, but maybe actually pursue, pursuing, it sounds like within the same organization, a lower lower level position. And the questionnaire references that you know you may want to find a slower pace for family reasons. That's why I put it into this last uh, bucket. But any thoughts about that, you know, Marge or Brian, about the, the either the pluses, minuses, perils, or just eyes wide open on making such a move? So, so it's interesting, right? I think I think that the reality is this goes to the question that was that was posed is that we're not going to be um, operating at the same high level of output all the time for your entire career, right? And I think that you we all have to think about where we are at any given point in time or where we might be, right, in, in, in the future. I know for me, you know, starting out at PepsiCo, you know, I, I was single and, and I could travel and I could really kind of spend a lot of time, you know, focused on my work. And then when things pivoted for me, when I settled down and, and, and had my, my twin boys, clearly I had to think about how I manage work differently. I think that, that knowing that though, and kind of building a, a reputation uh, within an organization and even with your colleagues so that they know that you will always produce, that you're always gonna be responsible, that you're always gonna deliver, will give you a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of room when you need to take that step back. I personally would never endorse saying I to take a lower level position because what I have found, at least in my career, is that lower level doesn't mean less work. So I think that it has it really depends on what what the nature of the work would be, um, how you would manage your time, and is there a way for you to remain at your current level with a different work arrangement? You know, talking to your to your boss and your managers and the organization is it, is it a type of culture where you can kind of adapt? A little bit to to what your life needs are because part of it is is also speaking up about what you need and if you've built a, a good reputation within the organization um there are ways that people want to keep you happy and that's part of also understanding how the organization wants to invest in you great let me um <clears throat> our intent was to start talking about different moves that we've made but uh we're getting some great questions so with uh with the okay and head nod for my two panelists and stuff, I'm gonna bang away at some of these Q and A's and see if we can uh, get after some of this stuff. Um, listen to your audience at all times. Uh, so forgive me for scrolling and I'm trying to just match up some of these questions. There's a few on, on compensation. Um, here's, a pri here's somebody that works at a privately held company without kind of traditional salary structures. Um, and the question is kind of how frequently should you expect salary increases Person's in the GC position of a two-person law department, uh, likes the culture, uh, feels valued, um, but no salary increases for five years. Uh, so my quick reaction, uh, and you guys can chime in, is, is uh, it's important to know what your value is in the market um, and ultimately to bring that data back uh, to the folks that you're dealing with who might not have a regular process for dealing with salary increases, which to me puts some burden on, the, on your market knowledge to be able to articulate, you know, what your fair, fair value is and stuff. Brian or Marge, any kind of quick hitting thoughts on that one? I mean, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's less of a function of whether it's privately or publicly held, right? I think it's more of a function of understanding what is your value um, and then kind of having a general conversation about what is the trajectory of growth, not just for yourself, right, but for the entire organization. And then you kind of start finding out whether this is something that's only applying to you or is it something that's applying across the board. You, you have to be proactive and you have to own that. Um, and I think that, 
when you have a level of credibility within your organization, next thing you know, you'll be able to influence a different approach to compensation, even in a privately held company that might be beneficial to, to a lot of people. Yeah, I think the I think that's right. I think the merit cycle kind of lends itself to for some to sit back and wait and uh, let things come to them in terms of whatever their you know potential uh, salary increase would be on an annual basis. But to Marjorie's point, I think being proactive is absolutely essential. Um, if you whether privately or publicly held doesn't matter um, merit cycle or not, know what you're worth, know your value. And if the value is not being received, then it's time for a conversation. And those aren't easy conversations to have all the time. Um, but certainly if you're in a position of performing and performing well at a high level, it really makes the conversation that much easier to say like, look, I mean, I'm doing what I'm supposed to and then some, you know, I feel like I should be fairly compensated if you're not already. Great, thank you. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I got the, my internet's a little wobbly. That, uh, that response probably answers another question um, from somebody that asked how to uh, deal with a compensation uh, discussion when you know you're undervalued, but the company insists that you're paid appropriately. I think you gotta get the market data. Um, somebody else asked a question about uh, a career change when their current position was amazing. You know, For the past few years, I've been in a compliance role. I've had very, uh, little stress, maximum flexibility, creative license, and great potential for impact. Yet I'm open to searching for a general counsel, chief legal officer position. Uh, am I crazy? I think the answer is you're not crazy. Uh, you're probably you're, you're listening to a guy right now that 15 months ago, you know, pulled the plug on being a GC of a Fortune 50 company, uh, which many people would view as crazy. Uh, but I had my own life matrix and an opportunity that I was glad to go pursue. Um, and it made sense for me, um, given what I was trying to do in my life. Uh, so it's a really personal question, but I, I think the question back to you would be, you know, how do you want to grow? Uh, are you going to be able to grow uh, in the job? Um, you know, the comfort and the stability of your roles got a lot of uh, attractiveness to it, perhaps. And maybe you put a lot of value on that. And that means that the um, whatever you would find in the market or the other opportunity has to overcome the benefits that you're currently getting out of your current role. And that's a, a balance that you'll have to weigh. Um, you know, pretty Dave, good just, to, just as you're talking that. about that, I, the, the, the life matrix or having a plan, Marjorie and I both referenced that earlier. I think that's the answer to the question is having one of those five years, mine's three years, you know, and how you go about making that plan is completely up to you. But having the plan is essential. Me personally, I sit down every winter and I write out, okay, here's my three-year plan for, you know, both personally and professionally. And then of course, you know, you, re you, you look at it, you know, once or twice during the year, am I on track? Or if I'm not, do I need to make a move or not? Or do, what do I do to course correct? And then you just revisit it every year um, just to make sure you're moving in the right direction to help yourself. Certainly you're gonna be in a position where sometimes you have some really great jobs. And that's awesome that you you can say that, but does it get you to your ultimate goal? If that's your ultimate goal, great. Don't no need to move. Um, but if you have aspirations of something different or bigger or what have you, the plan helps you kind of stay focused to get there. Yeah, I always think growth is being the number one indicator, you know. And growth has comes with uh, often some trade offs uh, and a little insecurity and a little scariness. Uh, on that topic, a um, couple of folks. Uh, chimed in to want to know thoughts about taking a non-legal role for a period of time, uh, perhaps an M&A or strategy, um, a, a role that would allow someone to grow, expand the leadership skill, broaden your business skills. Uh, is it something we're doing, uh, assuming your ultimate goal is to become a GC? Uh, has anybody taken that role? I don't think any of the three of us have, but we know people that have. Uh, some of them came back to the law department, others remained um, on the business side, to be frank, I think of people that went into HR at PepsiCo and came back. Um, and I know, you know, former colleagues that took, you know, business roles and just uh, started growing another garden and didn't necessarily come back. But any thoughts on any of those moves, non-business roles from either one? I think that's a great idea, right? I mean, I think um, especially when you are developing uh, business leadership skills. I think that it's a, a great way to expand 
um, your skill set beyond just being an advisor, but uh, you know, basically a decision maker uh, that that impacts the PNL um, and in other ways in the organization. And it obviously, I think, opens up a lot of new options that maybe were not, you know, on the radar when you were just focused in the law department. So I I I think it's a those are great opportunities. I'm going to try to hit a couple of remote questions. Uh, let me get two of them out here. Do you expect more GC CLO roles to eventually be remote with the expectation to travel to the corporate headquarters on a consistent basis? I've seen a good amount of new flexibility in roles below the director level, but less flexibility with roles that are director and above. Uh, and maybe a related question. My company's taking a hard line on hybrid working. I see this as having a detrimental effect on DE&I and burnout. How have the panelists thought about weighing up the accountability to their immediate team uh, versus doing the right thing for yourself personally? My current role on paper looks great, but I have an opportunity at a startup that is smaller. Um, so kind of the remote dynamic. Um, you know, at senior levels, uh, you know, relationships matter that much more. And, uh, you know, I don't necessarily see remote constructs growing in number. I actually personally, and a lot of people will differ with this comment, I actually see the curve coming back uh, at some point, not all the way to, you know, five days in the office. And by the way, even before COVID, my perspective was that most companies were four days in the office and Friday was a little bit more liberalized. So we were kind of four and one back then. We're headed to three and two or two and three, but I think at senior levels, um, you know, depending on the culture of the company, but um, I think you're going to be expected to be in person more or at least have better access uh, to the company without, you know, flying in from somewhere uh, remote. But I don't know if you guys have thoughts on kind of the remote dynamics and hybrid working arrangement. Sure, I, I can speak to it quite <laughs> quite easily because uh, because right now that's that is my role um, that is my job situation I commute down to North Carolina a few times a month and otherwise I'm working from home in New York so um, it's a dynamic that works for me um, again part of the life matrix and the plan but also something that you know my company my boss uh, our CEO was willing to accommodate um, that said you know, I do agree with Dave that I think the pendulum will be swinging back uh, to a more uh, in-office environment. Not to say that there won't be any flexibility. Of course, there will. But I do think that there you will see that pendulum swim, swing back a little bit. And it's going to be a challenge for, you know, it's going to have its pluses and minus, minuses, right? It's going to be a, an attraction issue and there's going to be a, a retention issue with any of those dynamics. So, um, you know, it's again, something you'll have to weigh for yourselves in your own, in your own matrix. But for me personally, this is, this fits the bill for me for the time. The only thing that I would add to that is um, as you're assessing an opportunity and whether the remote um, or hybrid uh, structure works. It has to be an analysis that you do in conjunction with the dynamics and the culture of the company and the organization. So, you know, I, I've had um, different opportunities in my career where I've managed teams that are not located in my home location. And managing, uh, you know, a team in different parts of the world, um, this is pre COVID, right? So it wasn't like a, a remote or hybrid structure. You have to think about how how best to be effective both with your team and your clients regardless of where they're located so you have to then figure out okay how can i execute on that how much do i do in person and therefore travel to where they are uh, how much do i bring them in how effective am i with the client set that i'm working with the business partners and where are they so all of that has to be part of your your calculus in terms of is this the type of situation that i know that i can be successful in under these circumstances, whether I'm remote, in person, or otherwise. So it, it's less about what the company has decided is their policy and more about how you can be most effective in your role. Only a few minutes left, so maybe a quick lightning round and then uh, I'll have a final thought or two. But um, the one's a tricky one that uh, this is from a, a chief compliance officer at a Fortune 100 company, loves the job, everything's good, but there's somebody higher up in the organization uh, that's really pretty toxic. Uh, so a good stable job, chief compliance officer, Fortune 100 company, uh, toxic senior 
member in the department, should I leave? Uh, tough situation. Um, you know, if you're a believer in the company, I generally believe that bad people uh, or toxic people get uh, flushed out of the organization at some point and that storms pass. Uh, but it takes some patience and perhaps uh, takes some time getting wet. Um, so it could be a tricky one uh, for sure. Uh, but if you like your job and you like your company, uh, I personally would give it some time. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of keep moving a little bit and cheat Marjorie and Brian of a chance to speak uh, to that one. Uh, getting bombarded with questions. So let me let me um, let me do this and suggest that anybody that really wants to chat, I think uh, both my colleagues and myself, you know, we're available on LinkedIn. Uh, we'd be glad to uh, to chat and follow up. Uh, with anybody uh, who might have a question that they want to uh, get through. Um, Marjorie and Brian actually have very demanding uh, day jobs, as do I, although my current job is actually to coach and try to share whatever perspective I have with other folks. And so I'm glad in particular uh, to, uh, to chat with anybody at any time. Uh, obviously, there are uh, a lot of folks in the marketplace you want to find mentors, et cetera, that you can go to, but feel free to reach out to me. I'd be glad to, uh, to chat with you and connect. Um, one final thought that uh, just comes to mind, especially for those folks that have teams out there, your manager of other people, while you may be listening to this webinar through your own lens, uh, don't forget the importance as a manager or as a leader of a department to constantly be thinking about what your team is thinking about. And so all the factors that we've been talking about on this uh, webinar today, uh, hopefully for each of you individually to benefit from and utilize, are all the things that all of your team members uh, are thinking about as well. And it's really important, I think, as a manager, as a leader in your organization, to, uh, to stay in touch and to keep your finger on the pulse of what your organization is thinking about, to, to keep the best folks, to keep the talent, to make sure that you're setting the right tone, being responsive to all the things that you would want your leader or boss to be uh, responsive to. And so on this slide, just a, just a few ideas uh, for you to think about in terms of how to stay in touch with, uh, with what your teams are thinking about. And just as a closing thought for those with teams to, uh, to stay in touch, keep that finger on the pulse to make sure that you're not being surprised by anybody leaving or uh, that you're not surprised by any feedback about how you as a leader could do better uh, in terms of the tone you're setting. Um, I know for a fact that my two colleagues, Brian and Marjorie, set an awesome tone. They are uh, former peers who I learned a lot from, including on this call. We could have talked for two or three hours. So my huge thanks to, uh, to both of them uh, for participating uh, today. And uh, sensitive to time, uh, with a minute to go, back to you, Bob. Close well, Marjorie, Brian, and Dave, thanks so much for sharing some, some real um personal stories and practical advice with, with everybody here in the in-house community. Um, for attendees who are interested to discuss more about how we can be of assistance, whether it's building, developing, or optimizing your uh, legal or compliance department, feel free to reach out to anyone on our team. Um, we have uh, uh, Dave and my contact information here. Um, we will be sending out just a, a one minute survey to everyone if, if that attended today. I would appreciate you just taking a minute to, to share your, your thoughts uh, as we're always looking to improve. Um, and just thank you for, for joining today. Um, we look forward to having you participate in the future with us. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.